World-renowned violinist Nigel Kennedy has been attacked by Baroness Deitch of Cumnor for something that he said at a BBC Proms concert featuring the Palestinian Strings, a group of talented young musicians aged between 12 to 23 years. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a bit facile to say it, but um, we all know from experience in this night of music tonight that um, given equality and getting rid of apartheid gives beautiful chance for amazing things to happen. Of course, there was no doubt that the audience agreed with him. And here is what former BBC governess Baroness Deitch had to say. The remark was offensive and untrue. There is no apartheid in Israel. Apartheid was a system based on racial classification and denial of franchise. This is not the case in Israel or Gaza or the West Bank. It is inappropriate to allow the Albert Hall to be used for inflammatory comments such as this. Imagine if a conductor with Spaniards in his orchestra used the proms to attack UK ownership of Gibraltar which would have won her a World Championship tournament trophy had the participants been playing with words rather than tennis or golf balls. But more of that in a moment. First, even if you have only the slightest compassion for a downtrodden people, hearken to the beauty of these young Palestinians playing under Nigel Kennedy's loving guidance. Listen, watch and weep. And sadly, that is all that BBC Radio 3 uploaded of the concert. Baroness Deitch seems not to have mentioned the music during her slanderous outburst, but she had the gall to call for an apology and request that the BBC remove the comment from any rebroadcast. So censorship is alive and well and residing in at least one seat in the upper house of the mother of all parliaments. Given such an impressive CV, she even has an Oxford University building named after her, it is a disgrace that a member of the House of Lords could tell so blatant a lie. The word apartheid means separateness in Afrikaans. In the context of South Africa, of course it was racially based. But, just as animals other than dogs can carry rabies, the word can be legitimately applied to the situation in Israel. Let's face it, if you are a Palestinian, you can't get more separateness than having walls and barbed wire fences built to keep you apart from the people who bulldoze your houses and steal your land while the peace talks go on, and on, and on, and on.
But that's okay as long as Zippy and Johnny are having fun, isn't it? Never mind that this is Kerry's sixth visit in recent months. Israel has just pulled the same stunt they did with Joe Biden back in March 2010, when the United States Vice President was virtually slapped in the face with a wet fish over the building of housing for Israelis in illegally occupied East Jerusalem. That time it was 1,600 new houses, this time it's 1,200. Is there anybody else out there who has the feeling that Israel doesn't want peace with the Palestinians? Or anyone else for that matter? Or is it just me? I mean, would any sane real estate developers build houses on land that they thought might be returned to the original owners in the foreseeable future? Give me a break. But there is one thing that intrigues me. Do they plan the peace talks first, and then the new housing, or the other way around? During any discussion about Israel, the compound words anti-Semitic and anti-Semitism are bound to crop up. And that's where other deceptions often begin, for the very words are deceptive themselves. The word Semitic refers to a group of languages which includes Arabic and Hebrew, and the numbers, about 206 million Arabic speakers, compared with about 7 million Hebrew speakers, makes the term anti-Semitic when referring to Jews a linguistic nonsense. Basically, this entire video is about linguistic goalpost moving, which is what Baroness Dietz's accusation against Simon Kennedy's truthful statement amounted to. But the British peer is in a junior league in this area when compared to a former Israeli member of parliament. Often when there is dissent expressed in the United States against policies of the Israeli government, um, uh, people here are called anti-Semitic. Uh, what is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? Well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe somebody is criticizing Israel, then we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country people are criticizing Israel, then they are anti-Semitic. And the organization is strong and has a lot of money. And the, the ties between uh, Israel and the American esta Jewish establishment are very strong. And they are strong in this country. As you know, uh, they have power, which it's okay, they are talented people and they have power, money and uh, media and other things. And their attitude is Israel, my country, right or wrong, the identification. And they are not ready to hear criticism. And it's very easy to blame people who criticize certain acts of the Israeli government as anti-Semitics and to bring up the Holocaust and the suffering of the Jewish people and that's, that justify everything we do to the Palestinians. Yes, you heard her correctly. And justify everything we do to the Palestinians. Things like this. And this sort of Israeli behavior has been virtually continuous since the Nakba. 65 years of desperate Palestinian hope buoyed up, then crushed by countless United Nations resolutions which have come to nothing. Blocked or sabotaged because the most powerful nation in the world is Zionist controlled. And it looks as though Britain is heading in the same direction. Tonight on Dispatches, our British policy is influenced by supporters of a foreign power. Peter Oborn is one of the few mainstream media journalists left who are worthy of the name. Dispatches reveals the activities of the most effective lobby working inside British political parties. I recommend that you watch the entire documentary as I have only time to include a few excerpts. What's unique about the pro-Israeli lobbies is that they have such good access to politicians. They often operate behind the scenes and they have primary regard, even though they may come from Britain, not to the interests of the British people, but to a mixture of what they see as British interests, but the interests of another country. Those lobby groups include, quite openly, the Conservative, Liberal Democrat, and Labour Friends of Israel, and Peter Oborn names a few more, which will come as no surprise. There's the Jewish Leadership Council. Of which Baroness Dietz was once a member. The Zionist Federation and the Board of Deputies of British Jews. 
aside from seeking to influence politicians and opinion formers, which is the stock and trade of any lobby, some members of the pro-Israel lobby are also especially aggressive towards British television and the press. Which returns us to one of the main points of this video, censorship. Not only did a member of the House of Lords insult Nigel Kennedy for speaking the truth, she had his words deleted from a music program, words which the British public had a right to hear, particularly as the BBC is a publicly funded broadcaster. And if there is any doubt that her ladyship got it dead wrong... In the occupied territories, Israel is an apartheid state. There's no two ways about it. When settlers travel on one road and Palestinians have to use another road, when settlers are governed by Israeli law and Palestinians are governed by military law, you are talking about apartheid. How refreshing to hear some straight talking from a top-of-the-range Jew about Israel's behavior towards the Palestinians. And here's some of that military law being applied to peaceful protesters at the apartheid or separateness wall at Nabi Saleh in the Ramallah district on May 13, 2011. Nabi Saleh is only about 33 kilometers as the crow flies from Tel Aviv, where Baroness Deitch is a board member of the Stephen Roth Institute for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism and Racism at Tel Aviv University. Please note the rather singular reference, as though it is the only kind of anti-ism worth worrying about. So as counterpoint, here's a rather clear example of anti-Palestinianism at Tel Aviv University on Nakba Day 2012. Hang on, where are all the Palestinian flags? Ah, here's one. In April 2012, Baroness Deitch gave a lecture at Gresham College, London. She is a very busy Baroness. And guess what? The issue of so-called anti-Semitism cropped up. The University and Colleges Union has been reported to the Equality and Human Rights Commission for institutional anti-Semitism. Please note, she did not say by whom. Abe Foxman of the ADL, for example, would accuse his mother of anti-Semitism if he thought it would get him a headline in the New York Times. But please, do carry on. The UCU, year on year, has passed anti-Israel boycott motions. And, as we've just seen, with very good reason. It has failed to moderate the online forum for its members, where anti-Semitic views are expressed. No use of the word alleged rather remiss of her, I would suggest, for Ruth Deitch graduated with a first in law and later spent 21 years as a tutorial fellow at Oxford. It has failed to engage with the concerns of members that legitimate anti-Israel criticism has shaded into anti-Semitism, which has led to the resignation of Jewish members and the commencement of legal action. But other Jews hold very different views about this issue. There is a split in the Jewish community about Israel. The leaders tend to be blindly pro-Israeli. The Israel lobby does represent a narrow right-wing agenda, but it's, it is not representative of the entire Jewish community. Nonetheless, we found that calling critics of Israel's foreign policy anti-Semitic has become a deliberate tactic among some of Israel's more strident lobby groups. But the matter of so-called anti-Semitism is far more fundamental. Never mind this kind of physical abuse, when it can become actionable for simply expressing one's reasonable dislike of a group of people because of their bad behavior or questionable religious practices, what about the hate speech by Jews against non-Jews so often repeated because it is indelibly enshrined in the teachings of the Old Testament. I can remember questioning this during what my school called divinity classes. More recently, Gideon Levy had a crack at addressing the issue, but failed miserably during the run-up to the finishing post. His article, Jewish People Are Just That, People and Far From Chosen, was critical of how literally many Jews take this overt statement of superiority. But in conclusion, he wrote, We should, of course, continue to read the prayer, You have chosen us. It is part of the Jewish heritage. 
What a cop-out. Never mind the heritage. The prayer, you have chosen us, is a very large part of the Jewish problem. So it's about time that highly educated Jews like Gideon Levy and Ruth Deitch realized that teaching young Jews that they are superior means that you are teaching them that all non-Jews are inferior. In my book, the prayer you have chosen us amounts to hate speech, and images like these prove my point. Now, with the fervent hope that people like Baroness Deitch might, at last, start thinking about the differences between cause and effect, I'm going to re-listen to that band of very talented, albeit unchosen people, the Palestinian Strings with the brilliant Nigel Kennedy.